Now, Indy, I gave you some inside baseball, but uh, right now there was uh, something that took place yesterday. And when I clip this video, I'll be posting the full link to the gray zone. Uh, but Jeremy Lofredo, um, who actually showed up on a gray zone live stream yesterday. So he is uh, yes. safe. He's back. I'm glad. Oof, um, but goodness. Uh, this is only two minutes and 35 seconds of the over. Cause again, he was on the, on their program for two hours, but um, this was a very eye opening interview. And if you hadn't seen anything from the gray zone, please support Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate and the rest of their team. They have done phenomenal work. We have referenced them in the past. The gray zone is one of the bastions of truth tellers. And we here at Harlan's media, not only give them a full salute, but acknowledge their, overall dauntless task of speaking truth to power and informing the public and the world about what is happening in current conflict zones as well as corruption in dc politics so they're one of the dauntless few that actually step up to the task and we give a full salute to the entire staff at the gray zone and what happened to jeremy lafredo was not right i find it absolutely disgusting him being detained as he covered a story that other people in corporate media covered so this is a, a video and I like to play it in full entirety. I'm going to be muting my mic as well uh, so that everyone can hear um, what exactly he went through because there's a follow-up video uh, just about the overall danger that journalists are in right now. So the U.S. Embassy did oh, yeah. here at that point. They, they did absolutely nothing. They knew I was an American citizen. They knew I was from New York. Um, they probably knew because they, they are, um, I would assume they can read. They can see that the charges are bogus. And still, they do nothing for me except send me an Israeli to to interrogate me further and um, call that person a social worker. Um, ben, you, were you at any point, you know, abused while you were in the Russian compound? Or, I mean, I I, I saw a photo of you. They they put you in front of the Israeli flag and photographed you, which they do to humiliate yes, they, Palestinian prisoners. They um. They put me in front of the Israeli flag. They put me in front of a, a like a kind of a nationalist flag with a war slogan on it. Together we will win. These, these are all over Israel right now. Um, and they took photos of me, not not um, official photos with a the camera. They were taking photos. These you know belligerent, fanatical um, guards and policemen were just taking photos on their iPhone and laughing. Um, it was not for any official purpose. I think that you know they were sending them into their WhatsApp. You know. Um, groups and you know simply just making fun of me they walk past my cell every now and then they say do you love israel and I, I wouldn't answer and then two others would come by and ask me if i love israel um they weren't you know professional in any way they simply saw me as a as a terrorist to to like berate and make fun of as i waited in solitary confinement for my court appearances but while i was in the russian compound you say that's a place where they you know it's mostly palestinians uh, palestinians are tortured there while i'm in solitary confinement there was a time where i could hear crying and screams of someone who i have no idea what was happening but it seemed like they were getting physically hurt um you you would hear cries and screams and something in arabic then it would stop and then it would start up again very very quickly and very like violently so i was i assumed that this person was being you know physically harmed in some way in a cell very close to mine but i couldn't see anything because i was in solitary confinement and so you were in this cell for three days without you weren't allowed out at any point except to be taunted and photographed I wasn't allowed at any point. Um, I, I wasn't allowed out at any point. There was no reason for them to let me out ever. Um, I, I was in solitary confinement. It, for the, I was, I've never been in prison. I've never been in trouble with the law. This is my first time ever being in trouble with the law. It's Israeli law, and I'm put in solitary confinement and treated like an, you know, an enemy of the state. So I wanted to play that video in its full entirety. I didn't want to interrupt his words, um, but I actually am proud to say uh, that we have reached out to him and we are coordinating to try and get him on the show. Uh, hopefully we can get him on there very soon, uh, but um, he's one of the dauntless few and it should not have happened. Now we all know the risks of what, what comes with covering into war zones and what happens here, but that was a U.S. citizen. Where were our politicians? Where were our leaders? Where were our representatives about what was happening to one of our own? Um, the whole idea of journalism is also to cover stories and, uh, you know, inform the people what's happening. 
Uh, Indy, uh, you, I know you guys at INN have been talking about this story. Um, I want to get your thoughts on this. I have a lot of feelings. Um, the U.S. abandoned one of our own because they don't like what he was saying and what he was reporting, and that he was reporting facts about what Israel was doing to the Palestinian people that are inconvenient to what the current administration would like people to know. So they just kind of turned a blind eye, which is really messed up. Um, it it just further proves that, you know, our country isn't the country that we think we live in. Um, that when it really comes down to it, often they're not there for you, especially if they you, they have a reason not to want to support you. They go out of their way to figure out a way not to support you. And it's messed up what they did to him. But journalism is under assault worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's not just in the United States. It's not just an American reporter in Israel. Journalists in the UK are literally being locked up for tweeting what the UK government is perceiving to be support for a terrorist entity. Any support for the Palestinian people. If you say, I support Hamas, you can be arrested at, under terrorism laws in the United Kingdom. It's absolutely frightening. They've upgraded and, and they, they passed this law called Section 12. They've been enforcing it, especially since Keir Starmer took over. And by the way, Keir Starmer and Kamala Harris see themselves as sister campaigns or, or as sister administrations, all right, where now the UK is giving advice to the Harris campaign on, on how they should conduct themselves and on how to look for misinformation, and yes, and, uh, and how to silence and suppress. And uh, look, I I am very afraid about what could happen very under much a so. Kamala administration. And before anyone says anything, well, what about Trump? I I get it, I understand it, and yes, there are some incidents what happened to uh, a lot of people under the Trump administration. Now, I want to be clear here: Harlan's Media, we've been doing this for seven years. That wave of censorship, how we got our World Heavyweight Championship belt, all happened after Trump was out of office, okay? Yes, there was a danger of censorship and demonetization under Trump, absolutely. But it got turned up to 11 under Biden, and I'm really concerned about what that would happen to us under a potential Kamala administration. It is something that myself and Daniel have talked about. Of, hey, how can we survive four years of Kamala? And yes, that's a very legit question to ask, especially if in your space, but it's not just only independent media you got to worry about. It's all your favorite content creators of all the genres. Why do you think Rumble and Kick and other platforms are growing in popularity? Because at least there, there at least there is a, a, a respect for the creators and what they're trying to do. I have no idea what's going to happen to Twitch. Twitch is a whole other animal altogether that I feel will one day implode under its own weight. But I want to read this because you shared this in the private chat. This is a um, mm -hmm. some written by an individual named Jonathan Cook. They never Indy came media to me. award honoree. And they never came for me because I was not a real journalist. So let's read this in its full entirety. First, they came for Julian Assange, and I did not speak out because I was not Julian Assange. Then they came for the Palestinian journalists, and I did not speak out because I was not a Palestinian journalist. Then they came at for the independent journalists, and I did not speak out because I was not an independent journalist. Then they came for the investigative journalists, and I did not speak out because I was not an investigative journalist. They never came for me, and I never spoke out because I was not a real journalist, because they followed orders. Thomas Hans approves. And the thing is, folks, there there is a real threat to journalism here. Uh, Indy, um, you know, I know that you have dealt with a lot of censorship and I know you've interviewed a lot of you, your network and your colleagues on the various shows that INN hosts. You guys have interviewed other people that have been silenced and suppressed. And there's the overall threat of a lot of us being deplatformed and censored. And of course, there's people like who work for the gray zone, like, uh, like Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate and everybody else. And even Matt Taibbi was threatened to be arrested. Matt Taibbi threatened to be arrested by a politician. Um, they sent the IRS to his house, knock yeah, on his I, door to intimidate the IRS, him. The IRS, the same institution that arrested Alphonse Capone, who did nothing wrong in my book, by the way. But nonetheless, I, I want to get your thoughts on, on, on and your concerns on the censorship that we are potentially facing off against here. Well, journalism is not a crime. Platform whack-a-mole is real. But what they're doing now is they're stepping it up. And what I'm worried about is that that the administrations are going to take the lead from the U.K., and start confiscating devices 
from journalists here that are dissident that speak out against the empire and speak out against what our military and intelligence communities are doing. Uh, I'm concerned that they're going to then put a blanket ban and say that you are not allowed to tweet or record a video. I mean, they're, they did that to Sarah Wilkinson. They're trying to do that to Asa Winstanley right now from the Electronic Intifada. They, they went to his house. They did not arrest him, the counterterrorism police, but they confiscated all his devices. He a They asked him for his passwords. He wouldn't give those up. They don't really need them. They can hack into his phones. They're going to mirror image them and hand it to a hacker and be able to access everything. Will he ever get his devices back? Nobody knows. What condition they'll be in? Nobody knows. And what they did was they said, if you don't want to have your house trashed, give up your devices right now. Um, there, there's, there's another thing, too, here, um, and that is what happens to journalists e e even even going forward? Because, you know, I want to pull up this video here. It's from the BBC. OK, and um, it has to deal with the conflict in um Gaza, or actually what's happening in Lebanon, to be more precise. So let's go mm -hmm. and pull up this video mm -hmm. here, folks. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's very eye-opening about, you know, the war on journalism. This, is, oh, this airstrike took place overnight, uh, hitting a compound where there was a, a row of chalets. And the first images that we've seen this morning show one of the chalets just reduced to a scorched rubble of its, of its remains. Um, some of the eyewitness journalists who were in the neighboring uh, chalets talk about the ceilings falling on them and hearing the sound of fighter jets overhead. Those three journalists were from two different Lebanese TV stations and staying in that compound, there were around seven different media organizations who were based there to report on the, uh, the fighting happening in the south of the country between uh, Israel's ground forces that are pushing into that area and the fighting with Hezbollah. The uh, eyewitness journalist who's spoken about their experience said the journalists there thought they they believed this area to be safe because whenever they would make a movement to go out and report or return back to that 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 compound, they would inform the local UN peacekeeping troops there, who they understood would then inform all relevant parties. Now, this morning, the Lebanese Minister of Information has called the airstrike a war crime. We haven't heard any uh, comments yet from the Israeli side on what the, uh, the, the on this airstrike. Um, and we know that the uh, journalists who are in the south of the, of the country there are really one of the sole sources of information coming from that area as the vast majority of residents in the south of the country on the border have left, been displaced by the fighting there and moved north. This is now that's a danger because first of all, holy, holy cow, airstrike, three journalists killed. And the UN peacekeeping three, wait, wait, three more, three more yeah. journalists killed, adding to the 175 they've already murdered. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there is, there is a war happening and uh, I hate to say it, but I think we kind of are kind of on the losing end. I like to be optimistic here, folks, but there's a problem with optimism and that is usually it can Usually it, it ends up being a huge disappointment, but this, this is, a, this is a, again, what is happening to a lot of our colleagues and our friends and people who are in media, especially those that are covering, you know, these major news stories. And unfortunately, what, 175 journalists dead in Gaza now add three more. I mean, how much higher does the body count have to get? And then you have to they're worry. Gonna, they're going to take out. They're platform. literally, Go they're literally going to try to kill everybody. That could that that speaks out against them until there's nobody left to speak out. So when I say it's going to get worse, I, I I don't say this with joy, like the Kamala Harris campaign. Joy? No, I say this with absolute fear because I think it's really going to get worse before it gets better. And the only way this is going to continue on is if more people step up. We need more citizen journalists out there. We need more independent media outlets out there. We need people speaking truth to power. We need to get our First Amendment secure in order to ensure that we never lose it. Because if these politicians have their way, if corporate media has its way, if the establishment has its way, if the corporate donors and the lobby groups have their way, that First Amendment is going to go so far bye-bye, doors will close and you will never see it again.
Now we got to work on open source media mm -hmm. and and abandon the corporate owned Zionist controlled media. YouTube, Meta, uh, uh, even uh, Musk on Twitter on on his Twitter, he's taking orders from BB. We have got to really start to look elsewhere to put our content and to look for content that is go that is not shaped by you know the Zionists that are murdering the journalists right now mm -hmm. that are only going to put propagandists like Anderson Cooper and Chris Cuomo on TV. Now, now there, there's 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 one thing I do want to say here, and I'll, I think I'm going to give Doctor Nick Riviera the final word on kick. Hey, BBC, who killed those journalists? Hey, media, those 175 journalists in Gaza. What happened? What happened to that? To, to remember those World uh, Central Kitchen Aid workers? How how they go bye bye? What happened? Who did it? Anyone know? Yeah, they never want to say that. I Raise never want hand. to say that. Raise a hand. Yes, no, maybe. You don't know. Hello, please, somebody, somebody, somebody. Not to mention one other thing here, too. Uh, wait, uh, I'm going to give this person the final word here. Uh, it's a super chat from uh, Penny Across. Tip $5. Submit support letters for the Uhuru 3 uh, by 1030, October uh, 30th. Hands off Uhuru. Uh, and absolutely. And look, um, for some reason, this administration is going after them, too. For some reason. Why? Shout out to the chairman. Because it's, it's Russia. It's Russia. -gate. It's all Russia. -gating, OK, all anyone Russia -gating, who has exactly. any kind of dissident journalist. OK, anyone who is going to do anything that's different from what Democrats and Republicans want. This is a duopoly thing. And the Republicans aren't pushing it as hard. But they locked up Julian Assange. It wasn't the Democrats. It was the Republicans. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so remember, folks, stand for free speech, stand for independent media, and stand in solidarity for the brave journalists. And also remember the brave journalists that have been either detained, silenced, deplatformed, or are no longer with us. If you fool me once, it's because I didn't think a guard was needed. If you fool me twice, it's because I didn't learn the lesson, so it bears repeating. If you try the same play three times running, it's because you know what's coming and you didn't come to lead. You came to purposefully be misleading. Democracy is dry. It's been a century bleeding. The husk is gaping open to the sky out in the field where all the sheep just keep on circling and worrying and bleeding. They're waiting for the shepherd that they've tried to hide their faith in, but he's so appealing. They'd gladly give their fleece. It's such a freeing feeling that even when he leads them to the ledge and starts to urge them on, they're positively beaming. They were told that they were on their way to save democracy, so even as they plummet, they just gloat. They don't consider screaming. And halfway up the cliff, the shepherd's cozy little mittens wrap around the staff of shattered human hopes on which he's leaning. He shows the gentle grin that used to stir your inner spark, and he says, not me, us, as he gestures to the oligarchs. He knows that if he runs, they're going to stop him like a stolen car. And he'll easily surrender because it bought a lot of time for laying mines in all the grassroots. Suddenly, the tiniest of movements gets you blown apart. Suddenly, you're in a play that's set on an election day and voting for the fire unaware you're playing Joan of Arc. Suddenly, the shepherd pulls the rug and slips a hood across your clueless mug and everything goes zero dark. I'm going to warn you once more before it's 2024 and you fuck around and find out who your heroes are to take a step back from the herd and you'll learn that you can spot who all the shearers are. If you really want to know the product that they're selling, I can take you where the mirrors are. If you think your voice is finally ready, I can tell you where the lyrics are. I hid them in a box I had to bury neath the cobble when they carpet bombed the promenade and raided all the street bazaars. Now all we've got's the marketplace, and you're too broke to even bother asking what the options for your treatment are. Suddenly, the raw debris of homeless human dignity will find it has a hundred teeth for every badge and sweeper's arm. Suddenly, they speak in solidarity, and each is armed. Suddenly, the sheep can see the shepherd for his truest form and all pitch in at once to help him buy the farm. And now it's zero dark. And all is calm and peaceful save the distant wail of sirens that approach beside the flames of dawn. 
Suddenly, the carrot's just a string that's on a stick, and all your movements make you sick because the prize is gone. Now, we could go and flee into the forest low and meek, or we could exercise our right to feast and go and graze on Biden's lawn. Because he's been sowing seeds that seep a toxin out to sap a bit from each of us and keep on leeching decades after Biden's gone. So regardless who they summon out of hell to come and do the job, it will not feel like Biden's gone. But in that time of hopelessness, you cannot trust the shepherd when he once again comes asking you to humor him his siren song. And it's cute that you can innocently, honestly assume that's just a symptom of a system that was wired wrong, and not the standard feature, basic function, primary objective of a mass hypnosis firebomb. You don't need to know the words to cry along. Someday it'll hit you like an officer who pistol whipped their right along, broke his jaw and kept his job and kept it moving right along. That voting isn't red or blue or black or white or right or wrong. Voting's like a firing squad where you can choose the firearm. It's slow extinction by and large. It's Super Tuesday supercharged. It's all your futures, roots and all, just tossed out on a garbage barge. It's everybody dropping out to push the biggest oligarch. It's everybody voting fire. Registered as Joan of Arc.